Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 20 Late in the evening I entered his study, after traversing an imposing but empty dining-room, very dimly lit. The house was silent. I was preceded by an elderly, grim Javanese servant in a sort of livery of white jacket and yellow sarong, who, after throwing the door open, exclaimed low, "O oh, master, and, stepping aside, vanished in a mysterious way, as though he had been a ghost only momentarily embodied for that particular service. Stein turned round with the chair, and, in the same movement, his spectacles seemed to get pushed up on his forehead. He welcomed me in his quiet and humorous voice. Only one corner of the vast room, the corner in which stood his writing-desk, was strongly lighted by a shaded reading-lamp, and the rest of the spacious apartment melted into shapeless gloom like a cavern. Narrow shelves filled with dark boxes of uniform shape and color ran round the walls, not from floor to ceiling, but in a somber belt about four feet broad. Catacombs of beetles. Wooden tablets were hung above at irregular intervals. The light reached one of them, and the word Coleoptera, written in gold letters, glittered mysteriously upon a vast dimness. The glass cases containing the collection of butterflies were ranged in three long rows upon slender-legged little tables. One of these cases had been removed from its place and stood on the desk, which was bestrewn with oblong slips of paper blackened with minute handwriting. "'So you see me. So,' he said. His hand hovered over the case, where a butterfly in solitary grandeur spread out dark bronze wings, seven inches or more across, with exquisite white veinings and a gorgeous border of yellow spots. "'Only one specimen like this they have in your London, and then no more.' <laughs> To my small native town, this my collection I shall bequeath. Something of me, the best. He bent forward in the chair and gazed intently, his chin over the front of the case. I stood at his back. Marvellous, he whispered, and seemed to forget my presence. His history was curious. He had been born in Bavaria, and when a youth of twenty-two had taken an active part in the revolutionary movement of 1848. Heavily compromised, he managed to make his escape, and at first found a refuge with a poor Republican watchmaker in Trieste. From there he made his way to Tripoli with a stock of cheap watches to hawk about. Not a very great opening, truly, but it turned out lucky enough, because it was there he came upon a Dutch traveller a rather famous man, I believe, but I don't remember his name. It was that naturalist who, engaging him as a sort of assistant, took him to the east. They travelled the archipelago together and separately, collecting insects and birds for four years or more. Then the naturalist went home, and Stein, having no home to go to, remained with an old trader he had come across in his journeys in the interior of Celebes, if Celebes may be said to have an interior. This old Scotsman, the only white man allowed to reside in the country at the time, was a privileged friend of the chief ruler of Wajo States, who was a woman. I often heard Stein relate how that chap, who was slightly paralyzed on one side, had introduced him to the native court a short time before another stroke carried him off. He was a heavy man, with a patriarchal white beard, and of imposing stature. He came into the council hall, where all the rajas, panjarans, and headmen were assembled, with the queen, a fat, wrinkled woman, very free in her speech, Stein said, reclining on a high couch under a canopy. He dragged his leg, thumping with his stick, and grasped Stein's arm, leading him right up to the couch. "'Look, Queen, and your Rajas, this is my son,' he proclaimed in a stentorian voice. "'I have traded with your fathers, and when I die he shall trade with you and your sons.' By means of this simple formality, Stein inherited the Scotsman's privileged position and all his stock in trade, together with a fortified house on the banks of the only navigable river in the country. Shortly afterwards the old Queen— who was so free in her speech, 
died, and the country became disturbed by various pretenders to the throne. Stein joined the party of a younger son, the one whom thirty years later he never spoke of otherwise but as my poor Mohammed Bonso. They both became the heroes of innumerable exploits, they had wonderful adventures, and once stood a siege in the Scotsman's house for a month, with only a score of followers against a whole army. I believe the natives talk of that war to this day. Uh, meantime, it seems, Stein never failed to annex to his own account every butterfly or beetle he could lay his hands on. After some eight years of war, negotiations, false truces, sudden outbreaks, reconciliation, treachery, and so on, and just as peace seemed at last permanently established, his poor Mohammed Bonso was assassinated at the gate of his own royal residence, while dismounting in the highest spirits on the return from a successful deer-hunt. This event rendered Stein's position extremely insecure, but he would have stayed, perhaps, had it not been that a short time afterwards he lost Mohammed's sister, my dear wife the princess, he used to say solemnly, by whom he had had a daughter, mother and child both dying within three days of each other from some infectious fever. He left the country which this cruel loss had made unbearable to him. Thus ended the first and adventurous part of his existence. What followed was so different that but for the reality of sorrow which remained with him, this strange part must have resembled a dream. He had a little money, he started life afresh, and in the course of years acquired a considerable fortune. At first he had travelled a good deal amongst the islands, but age had stolen upon him, and of late he seldom left his spacious house three miles out of town with an extensive garden, and surrounded by stables, offices, and bamboo cottages for his servants and dependents, of whom he had many. He drove in his buggy every morning to town, where he had an office with white and Chinese clerks. He owned a small fleet of schooners and native craft, and dealt in island produce on a large scale. For the rest he lived solitary, but not misanthropic, with his books in his collection, classing and arranging specimens, corresponding with entomologists in Europe, writing up a descriptive catalogue of his treasures. Such was the history of the man whom I had come to consult upon Jim's case, without any definite hope. Simply to hear what he would have to say would have been a relief. I was very anxious, but I respected the intense almost passionate absorption with which he looked at a butterfly, as though on the bronze sheen of these frail wings, in the white tracings, in the gorgeous markings, he could see other things, an image of something as perishable and defying destruction as these delicate and lifeless tissues displaying a splendor unmarred by death. Marvellous, he repeated, looking up at me. Look, the beauty! but that is nothing. Look at the accuracy, the harmony, and so fragile, and so strong, and so exact. This is nature, the balance of colossal forces. Every star is so, and every blade of grass stands so, and the mighty cosmos in perfect equilibrium produces this, this wonder, this masterpiece of nature, the great artist. Never heard an entomologist go on like this, I observed cheerfully. Masterpiece? And what of man? Man is amazing, but he is not a masterpiece, he said, keeping his eyes fixed on the glass case. Perhaps the artist was a little mad, eh? <laughs> what do you think? Sometimes it seems to me that man is come where he is not wanted, where there is no place for him. For if not, why should he want all the place? Why should he run about here and there, making a great noise about himself, talking about the stars, disturbing the blades of grass, catching butterflies, I chimed in. He smiled, threw himself back in his chair, and stretched his legs. Sit down, he said. I captured this rare specimen myself one very fine morning, and I had a very big emotion. 
you don't know what it is for a collector to capture such a rare specimen you can't know i smiled at my ease in a rocking chair his eyes seemed to look far beyond the wall at which they stared and he narrated how one night a messenger arrived from his poor mohammed requiring his presence at the residence as he called it which was distant some nine or ten miles by a bridle path over a cultivated plain with patches of forest here and there early in the morning he started from his fortified house after embracing his little emma and leaving the princess his wife in command he described how she came with him as far as the gate walking with one hand on the neck of his horse she had on a white jacket gold pins in her hair and a brown leather belt over her left shoulder with a revolver in it she talked as women will talk he said telling me to be careful and to try to get back before dark and what a great wickedness it was for me to go alone we were at war and the country was not safe my men were putting up bullet-proof shutters to the house and loading their rifles and she begged me to have no fear for her she could defend the house against anybody till i returned and i laughed with pleasure a little i liked to see her so brave and young and strong i was young too then at the gate she caught hold of my hand and gave it one squeeze and fell back i made my horse stand still outside till i heard the bars of the gate put up behind me there was a great enemy of mine a great noble and a great rascal too roaming with a band in the neighborhood i cantered four or five miles there had been rain in the night but the mists had gone up up and the face of the earth was clean it lay smiling at me so fresh and innocent like a little child uh, suddenly somebody fires a volley twenty shots at least it seemed to me i hear bullets sing in my ear and my hat jumps to the back of my head it was a little intrigue you understand they got my poor mohammed to send for me and then laid that ambush i see it all in a minute and i think this wants a little management my pony snort jump and stand and i fall slowly forward with my head on his mane he begins to walk and with one eye i could see over his neck a faint cloud of smoke hanging in front of a clump of bamboos to my left i think aha my friends why you not wait long enough before you shoot this is not yet gelungen <laughs> oh no i get hold of my revolver with my right hand quiet quiet after all there were only seven of these rascals they get up from the grass and start running with their sarongs tucked up waving spears above their head and yelling to each other to look out and catch the horse because i was dead i let them come as close as the door here and then bang 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 take aim each time too one more shot i fire at a man's back but i miss too far already and then i sit alone on my horse with the clean earth smiling at me and there are the bodies of three men lying on the ground one was curled up like a dog another on his back had an arm over his eyes as if to keep off the sun and the third man he draws up his leg very slowly and makes it with one kick straight again i watch him very carefully from my horse but there is no more bleibt ganz ruhig uh, keep still so and as i looked at his face for some sign of life i observed something like a faint shadow pass over his forehead it was the shadow of this butterfly look at the form of the wing this species fly high with a strong flight i raised my eyes and i saw him fluttering away i think can it be possible and then i lost him i dismounted and went on very slow leading my horse and holding my revolver with one hand and my eyes darting up and down and right and left everywhere at last i saw him sitting on a small heap of dirt ten feet away at once my heart began to beat quick i let go my horse keep my revolver in one hand and with the other snatch my soft felt hat off my head one step steady another step flop i got him when i got up i shook like a leaf with excitement 
and when I opened up these beautiful wings and made sure what a rare and so extraordinarily perfect specimen I had, my head went round and my legs became so weak with emotion that I had to sit on the ground. I had greatly desired to possess myself of a specimen of that species when collecting for the professor. I took long journeys and underwent great privations. I had dreamed of him in my sleep, and here suddenly I had him in my fingers for myself. In the words of the poet, he pronounced it Boet, So halt ich endlich dein in meinen Handen, und nenn es in gewissen Sinne mein. He gave to the last word the emphasis of a suddenly lowered voice, and withdrew his eyes slowly from my face. He began to charge a long-stemmed pipe, busily and in silence, then, pausing with his thumb on the orifice of the bowl, looked at me again significantly. Yes, my good friend, on that day I had nothing to desire. I had greatly annoyed my principal enemy. I was young, strong, I had friendship, I had the luff, he said luff, of a woman, a child I had to make my heart very full, and even what I had once dreamed in my sleep had come into my hands too. He struck a match which flared violently. His thoughtful, placid face twitched once. Friend, wife, child, he said slowly, gazing at the small flame. <sighs> the match was blown out. He sighed and turned again to the glass case. The frail and beautiful wings quivered faintly, as if his breath had for an instant called back to life that gorgeous object of his dreams. "'The work,' he began suddenly, pointing to the scattered slips, and in his usual gentle and cheery tone, "'is making great progress. I have been this rare specimen describing. Now, now, what is your good news?' "'To tell you the truth, Stein,' I said with an effort that surprised me, I came here to describe a specimen. Butterfly, he asked with an unbelieving and humorous eagerness. Nothing so perfect, I answered, feeling suddenly dispirited with all sorts of doubts. A man. Ah, so, he murmured, and his smiling countenance turned to me became grave. Then, after looking at me for a while, he said slowly, Well... I am a man, too. Here you have him as he was. He knew how to be so generously encouraging as to make a scrupulous man hesitate on the brink of confidence. But if I did hesitate, it was not for long. He heard me out, sitting with crossed legs. Sometimes his head would disappear completely in a great eruption of smoke, and a sympathetic growl would come out from the cloud. When I finished, he uncrossed his legs, laid down his pipe, leaned forward towards me earnestly with his elbows on the arms of his chair, the tips of his fingers together. I understand very well. He is romantic. He had diagnosed the case for me, and at first I was quite startled to find out how simple it was. And, indeed, our conference resembled so much a medical consultation— Stein, of learned aspect, sitting in an armchair before his desk, I, anxious, in another, facing him, but a little to one side, that it seemed natural to ask, "'What's good for it?' He lifted up a long forefinger. "'There is only one remedy. One thing alone can us, from being ourselves, cure.' The finger came down on the desk with a smart rap. The case which he had made to look so simple before became, if possible, still simpler, and altogether hopeless. There was a pause. Yes, said I. Strictly speaking, the question is not how to get cured, but how to live. He approved with his head, a little sadly as it seemed. Ja, ja. In general, adapting the words of your great poet, that is the question. He went on, nodding sympathetically. How to be! Ah, how to be! He stood up with the tips of his fingers resting on the desk. 
we want in so many different ways to be, he began again. This magnificent butterfly finds a little heap of dirt and sits still on it. But man, he will never on his heap of mud keep still. He wants to be so, and again he wants to be so. He moved his hand up, then down. He wants to be a saint, and he wants to be a devil. And every time he shuts his eyes, he sees himself as a very fine fellow. So fine as he can never be in a dream. He lowered the glass lid. The automatic lock clicked sharply, and taking up the case in both hands, he bore it religiously away to its place, passing out of the bright circle of the lamp into the ring of fainter light, into the shapeless dusk at last. It had an odd effect, as if these few steps had carried him out of this concrete and perplexed world. His tall form, as though robbed of its substance, hovered noiselessly over invisible things, with stooping and indefinite movements. His voice heard in that remoteness where he could be glimpsed mysteriously busy with immaterial cares, was no longer incisive, seemed to roll voluminous and grave, mellowed by distance. "'And because you not always can keep your eyes shut, there comes the real trouble, the heart pain, the world pain. I tell you, my friend, it is not good for you to find you cannot make your dream come true, for the reason that you are not strong enough, or not clever enough. Yeah, and all the time you are such a fine fellow, too. We? Was? Gott in Himmel! How can that be? <laughs> the shadow, prowling amongst the graves of butterflies, laughed boisterously. Yes, very funny this terrible thing is. A man that is born falls into a dream, like a man who falls into the sea. If he tries to climb out into the air, as inexperienced people endeavor to do, he drowns. Nictvar? No, I tell you, the way is to the destructive element submit yourself, and with the exertions of your hand and feet in the water, make the deep, deep sea keep you up. So, if you ask me how to be, his voice leaped up extraordinarily strong, as though away there in the dusk he had been inspired by some whisper of knowledge. I will tell you, for that too there is only one way. With a hasty swish-swish of his slippers he loomed up in the ring of faint light, and suddenly appeared in the bright circle of the lamp, his extended hand aimed at my breast like a pistol. His deep-set eyes seemed to pierce through me, but his twitching lips uttered no word, and the austere exultation of a certitude seen in the dusk vanished from his face. The hand that had been pointing at my breast fell, and by and by, coming a step nearer, he laid it gently on my shoulder. There were things, he said mournfully, that perhaps could never be told. Only he had lived so much alone that sometimes he forgot. He forgot. The light had destroyed the assurance which had inspired him in the distant shadows. He sat down, and with both elbows on the desk, rubbed his forehead. And yet it is true, it is true, in the destructive element, immerse. He spoke in a subdued tone, without looking at me, one hand on each side of his face. That was the way, to follow the dream and again to follow the dream, and so, evig, usque ad finem. The whisper of his conviction seemed to open before me a vast and uncertain expanse, as of a crepuscular horizon on a plain at dawn, or was it perchance the coming of the night? One had not the courage to decide, but it was a charming and deceptive light, throwing the impalpable poesy of its dimness over pitfalls, over graves. His life had begun in sacrifice, in enthusiasm for generous ideas. He had travelled very far on various ways, on strange paths, and whatever he followed it had been without faltering, and therefore without shame and without regret. 
In so far he was right. That was the way, no doubt. Yet for all that, the great plain on which men wander amongst graves and pitfalls remained very desolate under the impalpable poesy of its crepuscular light, overshadowed in the centre, circled with a bright edge, as if surrounded by an abyss full of frames. When at last I broke the silence, it was to express the opinion that no one could be more romantic than himself. He shook his head slowly, and afterwards looked at me with a patient and inquiring glance. It was a shame, he said. There we were, sitting and talking like two boys, instead of putting our heads together to find something practical, a practical remedy for the evil— for the great evil, he repeated, with a humorous and indulgent smile. For all that, our talk did not grow more practical. We avoided pronouncing Jim's name as though we had tried to keep flesh and blood out of our discussion, or he were nothing but an erring spirit, a suffering and nameless shade. Nah, said Stein, rising. Tonight you sleep here, and in the morning we shall do something practical. Practical. He lit a two-branched candlestick and led the way. We passed through empty, dark rooms, escorted by gleams from the lights Stein carried. They glided along the waxed floors, sweeping here and there over the polished surface of a table, leaped upon a fragmentary curve of a piece of furniture, or flashed perpendicularly in and out of distant mirrors, while the forms of two men in the flicker of two flames could be seen for a moment stealing silently across the depths of a crystalline void. He walked slowly a pace in advance with stooping courtesy. There was a profound, as it were, a listening quietude on his face. The long flaxen locks, mixed with white threads, were scattered thinly upon his slightly bowed neck. He is romantic, romantic, he repeated, and that is very bad, very bad. "'Very good, too,' he added. "'But is he?' I queried. "'Gewiss,' he said, and stood still, holding up the candelabrum, but without looking at me. "'Evident! What is it that by inward pain makes him know himself? What is it that for you and me makes him exist?' At that moment it was difficult to believe in Jim's existence— Starting from a country parsonage, blurred by crowds of men as by clouds of dust, silenced by the clashing claims of life and death in a material world. But his imperishable reality came to me with a convincing, with an irresistible force. I saw it vividly, as though in our progress through the lofty, silent rooms, amongst fleeting gleams of light, and the sudden revelations of human figures stealing with flickering flames within unfathomable and pellucid depths, we had approached nearer to absolute truth, which, like beauty itself, floats elusive, obscure, half-submerged in the silent, still waters of mystery. "'Perhaps he is,' I admitted with a slight laugh, whose unexpectedly loud reverberation made me lower my voice directly but I am sure you are. With his head dropping on his breast and the light held high, he began to walk again. Well, I exist too, he said. He preceded me. My eyes followed his movements, but what I did see was not the head of the firm, the welcome guest at afternoon receptions, the correspondent of learned societies, the entertainer of stray naturalists, I saw only the reality of his destiny, which he had known how to follow with unfaltering footsteps, that life begun in humble surroundings, rich in generous enthusiasms, in friendship, love, war, in all the exalted elements of romance. At the door of my room he faced me. Yes, I said, as though carrying on a discussion, and amongst other things you dreamed foolishly of a certain butterfly— but when one fine morning your dream came in your way, you did not let the splendid opportunity escape, did you? Whereas he— Stein lifted his hand. And do you know how many opportunities I let escape? How many dreams I had lost that had come in my way? 
He shook his head regretfully. It seems to me that some would have been very fine if I had made them come true. Do you know how many? Perhaps I myself don't know. Whether his were fine or not, I said, he knows of one which he certainly did not catch. Everybody knows of one or two like that, said Stein, and that is the trouble, the great trouble. He shook hands on the threshold, peered into my room under his raised arm. Sleep well. On tomorrow we must do something practical. Practical. Though his own room was beyond mine, I saw him return the way he came. He was going back to his butterflies. End of chapter 20 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapters 21 and 22 Chapter 21 I don't suppose any of you have ever heard of Patizan, Marlowe resumed, after a silence occupied in the careful lighting of a cigar. It does not matter. There's many a heavenly body in the lot crowding upon us of a night that mankind has never heard of, it being outside the sphere of its activities and of no earthly importance to anybody, but to the astronomers who are paid to talk learnedly about its composition, weight, path, the irregularities of its conduct, the aberrations of its light, a sort of scientific scandal-mongering. Thus with Patizan, it was referred to knowingly in the inner government circles in Batavia, especially as to its irregularities and aberrations, and it was known by name to some few, very few, in the mercantile world. Nobody, however, had been there, and I suspect no one desired to go there in person, just as an astronomer, I should fancy, would strongly object to being transported into a distant heavenly body, where, parted from his earthly emoluments, he would be bewildered by the view of an unfamiliar heavens. However, neither heavenly bodies nor astronomers have anything to do with Patizan. It was Jim who went there. I only meant you to understand that, had Stein arranged to send him to a star of the fifth magnitude, the change could not have been greater. He left his earthly failings behind him, and what sort of reputation he had, and there was a totally new set of conditions for his imaginative faculty to work upon. Entirely new, entirely remarkable. And he got hold of them in a remarkable way. Stein was the man who knew more about Patizan than anybody else. More than was known in the government circles, I suspect. I have no doubt he had been there, either in his butterfly-hunting days, or later on, when he tried, in his incorrigible way, to season with a pinch of romance the fattening dishes of his commercial kitchen. There were very few places in the archipelago he had not seen in the original dusk of their being before light, and even electric light, had been carried into them for the sake of better morality and, and, well, the greater profit, too. It was at breakfast of the morning following our talk about Jim that he mentioned the place, after I had quoted poor Briarly's remark, uh, let him creep twenty feet underground and stay there. He looked up at me with interested attention, as though I had been a rare insect. "'This could be done, too,' he remarked, sipping his coffee. "'Bury him in some sort,' I explained. "'One doesn't like to do it, of course, but it would be the best thing, seeing what he is.' "'Yes, he is young,' Stein mused. "'The youngest human being now in existence,' I affirmed. "'Schön. There's Patizan.' he went on in the same tone. And the woman is dead now, he added incomprehensibly. Of course I don't know that story. I can only guess that once before Patizan had been used for the grave of some sin, transgression, or misfortune. It is impossible to suspect Stein. The only woman that had ever existed for him was the Malay girl he called My Wife the Princess, or more rarely, in moments of expansion, the mother of my Emma. Who was the woman he had mentioned in connection with Patizan, I can't say, 
but from his allusions I understand she had been an educated and very good-looking Dutch Malay girl with a tragic, or perhaps only a pitiful history, whose most painful part, no doubt, was her marriage with a Malacca Portuguese who had been a clerk in some commercial house in the Dutch colonies. I gathered from Stein that this man was an unsatisfactory person in more ways than one, all being more or less indefinite and offensive. It was solely for his wife's sake that Stein had appointed him manager of Stein and Company's trading post in Patizan, but commercially the arrangement was not a success, at any rate for the firm, and now the woman had died, Stein was disposed to try another agent there. The Portuguese, whose name was Cornelius, considered himself a very deserving but ill-used person, entitled by his abilities to a better position. This man Jim would have to relieve. "'But I don't think he will go away from the place,' remarked Stein. "'That has nothing to do with me. It was only for the sake of the woman that I—' uh... "'But I think there is a daughter left.' I shall let him, if he likes, stay, keep the old house. Patizan is a remote district of a native-ruled state, and the chief settlement bears the same name. At a point on the river, about forty miles from the sea, where the first houses come into view, there can be seen rising above the level of the forest the summits of two steep hills very close together, and separated by what looks like a deep fissure the cleavage of some mighty stroke. As a matter of fact, the valley between is nothing but a narrow ravine. The appearance from the settlement is of one irregularly conical hill split in two, and with the two halves leaning slightly apart. On the third day after the full, the moon is seen from the open space in front of Jim's house. He had a very fine house in the native style when I visited him, rose exactly behind these hills, its diffused light at first throwing the two massives into intensely black relief, and then the nearly perfect disk, glowing ruddily, appeared, gliding upwards between the sides of the chasm till it floated away above the summits, as if escaping from a yawning grave in gentle triumph. "'Wonderful effect,' said Jim by my side. "'Worth seeing, is it not?' And this question was put with a note of personal pride that made me smile, as though he had had a hand in regulating that unique spectacle. He had regulated so many things in Patizan, things that would have appeared as much beyond his control as the motions of the moon and the stars. It was inconceivable. That was the distinctive quality of the part into which Stein and I had tumbled him unwittingly, with no other notion than to get him out of the way, out of his own way, be it understood. That was our main purpose, though I own I might have had another motive which had influenced me a little. I was about to go home for a time, and it may be I desired, more than I was aware of myself, to dispose of him. To dispose of him, you understand, before I left. I was going home, and he had come to me from there, with his miserable trouble and his shadowy claim, like a man panting under a burden in a mist. I could not say I had ever seen him distinctly, not even to this day after I had my last view of him. But it seemed to me that the less I understood, the more I was bound to him in the name of that doubt which is the inseparable part of our knowledge. I did not know so much more about myself— and then, I repeat, I was going home, to that home distant enough for all its hearthstones to be like one hearthstone, by which the humble of us has a right to sit. We wander in our thousands over the face of the earth, the illustrious and the obscure, earning beyond the sea our fame, our money, or only a crust of bread. But it seems to me that for each of us going home must be like going to render an account— we return to face our superiors, our kindred, our friends, those whom we obey, those whom we love. But even they who have neither, the most free, lonely, irresponsible, and bereft of ties, even those for whom home holds no dear face, no familiar voice, even they have to meet the spirit that dwells within the land, 
under its sky, in its air, in its valleys, and on its rises, in its fields, in its waters, and its trees, a mute friend, judge, and inspirer. Say what you like, to get its joy, to breathe its peace, to face its truth, one must return with a clear conscience. All this may seem to you sheer sentimentalism, and indeed very few of us have the will or the capacity to look consciously under the surface of familiar emotions. There are the girls we love, the men we look up to, the tenderness, the friendships, the opportunities, the pleasures. But the fact remains that you must touch your reward with clean hands, lest it turn to dead leaves, to thorns in your grasp. I think it is the lonely, without a fireside or an affection they may call their own, those who return not to a dwelling but to the land itself, to meet its disembodied, eternal, and unchangeable spirit. It is those who understand best its severity, its saving power, the grace of its secular right to our fidelity, to our obedience. Yes, a few of us understand. But we all feel it, though, and I say all without exception, because those who do not feel do not count. Each blade of grass has its spot on the earth whence it draws its life, its strength, and so is man rooted to the land from which he draws his faith together with his life. I don't know how much Jim understood, but I know he felt, he felt confusedly but powerfully, the demand of some such truth or some such illusion, I don't care how you call it, there is so little difference, and the difference means so little. The thing is that in virtue of his feeling he mattered. He would never go home now, not he, never. Had he been capable of picturesque manifestations, he would have shuddered at the thought, and made you shudder too. But he was not of that sort, though he was expressive enough in his way. Before the idea of going home he would grow desperately stiff and immovable, with lowered chin and pouted lips, and with those candid blue eyes of his glowering darkly under a frown, as if before something unbearable, as if before something revolting. There was imagination in that hard skull of his over which the thick clustering hair fitted like a cap. As to me, I have no imagination. I would be more certain about him to-day if I had. And I do not mean to imply that I figured to myself the spirit of the land uprising above the white cliffs of Dover to ask me what I, returning with no bones broken, so to speak, had done with my very young brother. I could not make such a mistake. I knew very well he was one of those about whom there is no inquiry. I had seen better men go out, disappear, vanish utterly, without provoking a sound of curiosity or sorrow. The spirit of the land, as becomes the ruler of great enterprises, is careless about innumerable lives. Woe to the stragglers! We exist only in so far as we hang together. He had straggled in a way, he had not hung on, but he was aware of it with an intensity that made him touching, just as a man's more intense life makes his death more touching than the death of a, a tree. I happen to be handy and I happened to be touched. That's all there is to it. I was concerned as to the way he would go out. It would have hurt me if, for instance, he had taken to drink. The earth is so small that I was afraid of some day being waylaid by a blear-eyed, swollen-faced, besmirched loafer with no soles to his canvas shoes, and with a flutter of rags about the elbows, who, on the strength of old acquaintance, would ask for a loan of five dollars. You know the awful, jaunty bearing of these scarecrows coming to you from a decent past, the rasping, careless voice, the half-averted, impudent glances, those meetings more trying to a man who believes in the solidarity of our lives than the sight of an impenitent deathbed to a priest. That, to tell you the truth, was the only danger I could see for him and for me. But I also mistrusted my want of imagination— it might even come to something worse, in some way it was beyond my powers of fancy to foresee. You wouldn't let me forget how imaginative he was, and your imaginative people swing farther in any direction, as if given a longer scope of cable in the uneasy anchorage of life. 
They do. They take to drink, too. It may be I was belittling him by such a fear. How could I tell? Even Stein could say no more than that he was romantic. I only knew he was one of us. And what business had he to be romantic? I am telling you so much about my own instinctive feelings and bemused reflections, because there remains so little to be told of him. He existed for me, and, after all, it is only through me that he exists for you. I have led him out by the hand. I have paraded him before you. Were my commonplace fears unjust? I won't say. Not even now. You may be able to tell better, since the proverb has it that the onlookers see most of the game. At any rate, they were superfluous. He did not go out, not at all. On the contrary, he came on wonderfully, came on straight as a die in an excellent form, which showed that he could stay as well as spurt. I ought to be delighted, for it is a victory in which I had taken my part. But I am not so pleased as I would have expected to be. I ask myself whether his rush had really carried him out of that mist in which he loomed, interesting if not very big, with floating outlines, a straggler yearning inconsolably for his humble place in the ranks. And besides, the last word is not said, probably shall never be said. Are not our lives too short for that full utterance, which through all our stammerings is of course our only and abiding intention? I have given up expecting those last words, whose ring, if they could only be pronounced, would shake both heaven and earth. There is never time to say our last word, the last word of our love, of our desire, faith, remorse, submissions, revolt. The heaven and the earth must not be shaken, I suppose, at least not by us who know so many truths about either. My last words about Jim shall be few. I affirm he had achieved greatness, but the thing would be dwarfed in the telling, or rather in the hearing. Frankly, it is not my words that I mistrust, but uh, your minds. I could be eloquent were I not afraid you fellows had starved your imaginations to feed your bodies. I do not mean to be offensive. It is respectable to have no illusions, and safe, and profitable, and dull. Yet you, too, in your time must have known the intensity of life, that light of glamour created in the shock of trifles, as amazing as the glow of sparks struck from a cold stone, and as short-lived, alas. CHAPTER Twenty Two. The conquest of love, honour, men's confidence, the pride of it, the power of it, are fit materials for a heroic tale. Only our minds are struck by the externals of such a success, and to Jim's successes there were no externals. Thirty miles of forest shut it off from the sight of an indifferent world, and the noise of the white surf along the coast overpowered the voice of fame. The stream of civilization, as if divided on a headland a hundred miles north of Padazan, branches east and southeast, leaving its plains and valleys, its old trees and its old mankind, neglected and isolated such as an insignificant and crumbling islet between two branches of a mighty devouring stream. You find the name of the country pretty often in collections of old voyages. The seventeenth-century traders went there for pepper, because the passion for pepper seemed to burn like a flame of love in the breasts of Dutch and English adventurers about the time of James I. Where wouldn't they go for pepper? For a bag of pepper they would cut each other's throats without hesitation, and would forswear their souls, of which they were so careful otherwise. The bizarre obstinacy of that desire made them defy death in a thousand shapes, the unknown seas, the loathsome and strange diseases, wounds, captivity, hunger, pestilence, and despair. It made them great. By heavens, it made them heroic! and it made them pathetic, too, in their craving for trade with the inflexible death levying its toll on young and old. It seems impossible to believe that mere greed could hold men to such a steadfastness of purpose, to such a blind persistence in endeavour and sacrifice, and indeed those who adventured their persons and lives 
risked all they had for a slender reward. They left their bones to lie bleaching on distant shores so that wealth might flow to the living at home. To us, their less tried successors, they appear magnified, not as agents of trade, but as instruments of a recorded destiny, pushing out into the unknown in obedience to an inward voice, to an impulse beating in the blood, to a dream of the future. They were wonderful, and it must be owned that they were ready for the wonderful. They recorded it complacently in their sufferings, in the aspect of the seas, in the customs of strange nations, in the glory of splendid rulers. In Patizan they had found lots of pepper, and had been impressed by the magnificence and the wisdom of the sultan. But somehow, after a century of checkered intercourse, the country seems to drop gradually out of the trade. Perhaps the pepper had given out. Be it as it may, nobody cares for it now. The glory has departed. The sultan is an imbecile youth with two thumbs on his left hand, and an uncertain and beggarly revenue— extorted from a miserable population and stolen from him by his many uncles. This, of course, I have from Stein. He gave me their names and a short sketch of the life and character of each. He was as full of information about native states as an official report, but uh, infinitely more amusing. He had to know. He traded in so many, and in some districts, as in Patizan, for instance, his firm was the only one to have an agency by special permit from the Dutch authorities. The government trusted his discretion, and it was understood that he took all the risks. The men he employed understood that, too, but he made it worth their while, apparently. He was perfectly frank with me over the breakfast-table in the morning. As far as he was aware, the last news was thirteen months old, he stated precisely, utter insecurity for life and property was the normal condition. There were in Patizan antagonistic forces, and one of them was Raja Alang, the worst of the sultan's uncles, the governor of the river, who did the extorting and the stealing, and ground down to the point of extinction the country-born Malays, who, utterly defenceless, had not even the resource of emigrating. For indeed, as Stein remarked, where could they go, and how could they get away? No doubt they did not even desire to get away— the world, which is circumscribed by lofty, impassable mountains, has been given into the hands of the high-born, and this Rajah they knew. He was of their own royal house. I had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman later on. He was a dirty, little, used-up old man, with evil eyes and a weak mouth, who swallowed an opium pill every two hours, and in defiance of common decency wore his hair uncovered and falling in wild stringy locks about his wizened grimy face. When giving audience he would clamber upon a sort of narrow stage erected in a hall like a ruinous barn with a rotten bamboo floor, through the cracks of which you could see twelve or fifteen feet below, the heaps of refuse and garbage of all kinds lying under the house— that is where and how he received us when, accompanied by Jim, I paid him a visit of ceremony. There were about forty people in the room, and perhaps three times as many in the great courtyard below. There was a constant movement, coming and going, pushing and murmuring at our backs. A few youths in gay silks glared from the distance. The majority, slaves and humble dependents, were half-naked in ragged sarongs, dirty with ashes and mud-stains. I had never seen Jim look so grave, so self-possessed, in an impenetrable, impressive way. In the midst of these dark-faced men, his stalwart figure in white apparel, the gleaming clusters of his fair hair seemed to catch all the sunshine that trickled through the cracks in the closed shutters of that dim hall, with its walls of mats and a roof of thatch. He appeared like a creature not only of another kind, but of another essence— had they not seen him come up in a canoe, they might have thought that he had descended upon them from the clouds. He did, however, come in a crazy dugout, sitting very still and with his knees together for fear of overturning the thing, uh, sitting on a tin box which I had lent him, nursing on his lap a revolver of the navy pattern presented by me on parting, which, through an interposition of providence, or through some wrong-headed notion that was just like him, 
or else from sheer instinctive sagacity he had decided to carry unloaded. That's how he ascended the Patizan River. Nothing could have been more prosaic and more unsafe, more extravagantly casual, more lonely. Strange, this fatality that would cast the complexion of a flight upon all his acts, of impulsive, unreflecting desertion of the jump into the unknown. It is precisely the casualness of it that strikes me most. Neither Stein nor I had a clear conception of what might be on the other side when we, metaphorically speaking, took him up and hove him over the wall with scant ceremony. At the moment I merely wished to achieve his disappearance. Stein, characteristically enough, had a sentimental motive. He had a notion of paying off, in kind, I suppose, the old debt he had never forgotten. Indeed, he had been all his life especially friendly to anybody from the British Isles. His late benefactor, it is true, was a Scot, even to the length of being called Alexander McNeil, and Jim came from a long way south of the Tweed. But at a distance of six or seven thousand miles, Great Britain, though never diminished, looks foreshortened enough even to its own children to rob such details of their importance. Stein was excusable, and his hinted intentions were so generous that I begged him most earnestly to keep them secret for a time. I felt that no consideration of personal advantage should be allowed to influence Jim, that not even the risk of such influence should be run. We had to deal with another sort of reality. He wanted a refuge, and a refuge at the cost of danger should be offered him. Nothing more. Upon every other point I was perfectly frank with him, and I even, as I believed at the time, exaggerated the danger of the undertaking. As a matter of fact, I did not do it justice. His first day on Patizan was nearly his last, would have been his last, if he had not been so reckless or so hard on himself, and had condescended to load that revolver. I remember, as I unfolded our precious scheme for his retreat, how his stubborn but weary resignation was gradually replaced by surprise, interest, wonder, and by boyish eagerness. This was the chance he had been dreaming of. He couldn't think how he merited that I— He would be shot if he could see that to what he owed. And it was Stein, Stein the merchant, who— But of course it was me he had to— I cut him short. He was not articulate, and his gratitude caused me inexplicable pain. I told him that if he owed this chance to any one especially, it was to an old Scot of whom he had never heard, who had died many years ago, and of whom little was remembered besides a roaring voice and a rough sort of honesty. There was really no one to receive his thanks. Stein was passing on to a young man the help he had received in his own young days, and I had done no more than to mention his name. Upon this he coloured, and, twisting a bit of paper in his fingers, he remarked bashfully that I had always trusted him. I admitted that such was the case, and added after a pause that I wished he had been able to follow my example. "'You think I don't?' he asked uneasily, and remarked in a mutter that one had to get some sort of show first. Then, brightening up, and in a loud voice, he protested that he would give me no occasion to regret my confidence. Which, which— "'Do not misapprehend,' I interrupted. "'It is not in your power to make me regret anything.' "'There would be no regrets, but if there were, it would be altogether my own affair. "'On the other hand, I wished him to understand clearly that this arrangement, this, uh, this experiment, was his own doing. "'He was responsible for it, and no one else. "'Why, why,' he stammered, "'this is the very thing that I—' I begged him not to be dense, and he looked more puzzled than ever. He was in a fair way to make life intolerable to himself. "'Do you think so?' he asked, disturbed, but in a moment added confidently, "'I was going on, though. Was I not?' It was impossible to be angry with him. I could not help a smile, and I told him that in the old days people who went on like this were on the way of becoming hermits in a wilderness. "'Hermits be hanged!' he commented, with engaging impulsiveness. "'Of course he didn't mind a wilderness.' "'I was glad of it,' I said. "'That was where he would be going to. "'He would find it lively enough,' I ventured to promise. "'Yes, yes,' he said keenly. 
He had shown a desire, I continued inflexibly, to go out and shut the door after him. Did I? He interrupted, in a strange access of gloom that seemed to envelop him from head to foot, like the shadow of a passing cloud. He was wonderfully expressive, after all. Wonderfully. Did I? he repeated bitterly. You can't say I made much noise about it. And I can keep it up, too. Only, confound it, you show me a door. Very well. Pass on, I struck in. I could make him a solemn promise that it would be shut behind him with a vengeance. His fate, whatever it was, would be ignored, because the country, for all its rotten state, was not judged ripe for interference. Once he got in, it would be for the outside world as though he had never existed. He would have nothing but the soles of his two feet to stand upon, and he would have first to find his ground at that. Never existed. <laughs> That's it, by Jove, he murmured to himself. His eyes, fastened upon my lips, sparkled. If he had thoroughly understood the conditions, I concluded, he had better jump into the first gary he could see, and drive on to Stein's house for his final instructions. He flung out of the room before I had fairly finished speaking. End of chapters 21 and 22 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapters 23 and 24 Chapter 23 He did not return till next morning. He had been kept to dinner and for the night. There never had been such a wonderful man as Mr. Stein. He had in his pocket a letter for Cornelius, the Johnny who's going to get the sack, he explained with a momentary drop in his elation, and he exhibited with glee a silver ring such as natives use, worn down very thin and showing faint traces of chasing. This was his introduction to an old chap called Doraman, one of the principal men out there, a big pot, who had been Mr. Stein's friend in that country where he had all these adventures. Mr. Stein called him War Comrade. War Comrade was good, wasn't it? And didn't Mr. Stein speak English wonderfully well? Said he had learned it in Celebes, of all places. That was awfully funny, was it not? He did speak with an accent, a twang. Did I notice? That chap Doraman had given him the ring. They had exchanged presents when they parted for the last time sort of promising eternal friendship. He called it fine. Did I not? They had to make a dash for dear life out of the country when that Mohammed, Mohammed, what's-his-name, had been killed. I knew the story, of course. Seemed a beastly shame, didn't it? He ran on like this, forgetting his plate with knife and fork in hand. He had found me at Tiffin. Slightly flushed, and with his eyes darkened many shades, which was in him a sign of excitement. The ring was a sort of credential. It's like something you read of in books, he threw in appreciatively. And Doraman would do his best for him. Mr. Stein had been the means of saving that chap's life on some occasion. Purely by accident, Mr. Stein had said, but he, Jim, had his own opinions about that. Mr. Stein was just the man to look out for such accidents. No matter, accident or purpose, this would serve his turn immensely. Hope to goodness the jolly old beggar had not gone off the hooks meantime. Mr. Stein could not tell. There had been no news for more than a year. They were kicking up no end of an all-fired row amongst themselves, and the river was closed. Jolly awkward this, but no fear. He would manage to find a crack to get in. He impressed, almost frightened me, with his elated rattle. He was voluble like a youngster on the eve of a long holiday, with the prospect of delightful scrapes, and such an attitude of mind in a grown man, and in this connection had in it something phenomenal, a little mad, dangerous, unsafe. I was on the point of entreating him to take things seriously when he dropped his knife and fork. He had begun eating, or rather swallowing food, as it were, unconsciously, and began a search all round his plate. The ring! The ring! Where the devil! Ah, here it was! He closed his big hand on it, and tried all his pockets, one after another. Jove! Wouldn't do to lose the thing. He meditated gravely over his fist. Had it? Would hang the bolly affair round his neck. 
and he proceeded to do this immediately, producing a string which looked like a bit of a cotton shoelace for the purpose. There, that would do the trick. It would be the deuce if... He seemed to catch sight of my face for the first time, and it steadied him a little. I probably didn't realize, he said, with a naive gravity, how much importance he attached to that token. It meant a friend, and it is a good thing to have a friend. He knew something about that. He nodded at me expressively, but before my disclaiming gesture he leaned his head on his hand, and for a while sat silent, playing thoughtfully with the bread-crumbs on the cloth. "'Slam the door! That was jolly well put!' he cried, and jumping up began to pace the room, reminding me by the set of the shoulders, the turn of his head, the headlong and uneven stride, of that night when he had paced thus, confessing, explaining, what you will, but in the last instance living, living before me, under his own little cloud, with all his unconscious subtlety which could draw consolation from the very source of sorrow. It was the same mood, the same, and different, like a fickle companion that to-day, guiding you on the true path, with the same eyes, the same step, the same impulse, to-morrow will lead you hopelessly astray. His tread was assured, his straying, darkened eyes seemed to search the room for something. One of his footfalls somehow sounded louder than the other, the fault of his boots, probably, and gave a curious impression of an invisible halt in his gait. One of his hands was rammed deep into his trousers' pocket, the other waved suddenly above his head. "'Slam the door!' he shouted. "'I've been waiting for that. I'll show yet. I'll—' I'm ready for any confounded thing. I've been dreaming of it. Jove! Get out of this. Jove! This is luck at last. You wait! I'll— He tossed his head fearlessly, and I confess that for the first and last time in our acquaintance I perceived myself unexpectedly to be thoroughly sick of him. Why these vaporings? He was stumping about the room, flourishing his arm absurdly, and now and then feeling on his breast for the ring under his clothes. Where was the sense of such exultation in a man appointed to be a trading clerk, and in a place where there was no trade at that? Why hurl defiance at the universe? This was not a proper frame of mind to approach any undertaking. An improper frame of mind not only for him, I said, but for any man. He stood still over me. Did I think so? he asked by no means subdued, and with a smile in which I seemed to detect suddenly something insolent. But then I am twenty years his senior. Youth is insolent. It is its right, its necessity. It has got to assert itself, and all assertion in this world of doubts is a defiance, is an insolence. He went off into a far corner, and coming back he, figuratively speaking, turned to rend me. I spoke like that because I, even I, who had been no end kind to him, even I remembered, remembered against him what, what had happened. And what about the others, the, the world? Where's the wonder he wanted to get out, meant to get out, meant to stay out, by heavens? And I talked about proper frames of mind. It is not I or the world who remember, I shouted. It is you, you who remember. He did not flinch, and went on with heat. "'Forget everything. Everybody. Everybody,' his voice fell. "'But you,' he added. "'Yes, me too, if it would help,' I said also in a low tone. After this we remained silent and languid for a time, as if exhausted. Then he began again, composedly, and told me that Mr. Stein had instructed him to wait for a month or so to see whether it was possible for him to remain before building a new house for himself, so as to avoid vain expense. He did make use of funny expressions, Stein did. Vain expense was good. Remain? Why, of course. He would hang on. Let him only get in, that's all. He would answer for it he would remain. Never get out. It was easy enough to remain." "'Don't be foolhardy,' I said, rendered uneasy by his threatening tone. 
If you only live long enough, you will want to come back. Come back to what? he asked absently, with his eyes fixed upon the face of a clock on the wall. I was silent for a while. Is it to be never, then? I said. Never, he repeated dreamily, without looking at me, and then flew into sudden activity. Jove! Two o'clock, and I sail at four! It was true. A brigantine of Stein's was leaving for the westward that afternoon, and he had been instructed to take his passage in her. Only no orders to delay the sailing had been given. I suppose Stein forgot. He made a rush to get his things while I went aboard my ship, where he promised to call on his way to the outer roadstead. He turned up accordingly, in a great hurry, and with a small leather valise in his hand. This wouldn't do, and I offered him an old tin trunk of mine, supposed to be watertight, or at least damp-tight. He effected the transfer by the simple process of shooting out the contents of his valise as you would empty a sack of wheat. I saw three books in the tumble, two small in dark covers, and a thick green and gold volume, a half-crown complete Shakespeare. "'You read this?' I asked. "'Yes, best thing to cheer up a fellow,' he said hastily. I was struck by this appreciation, but there was no time for Shakespearean talk. A heavy revolver and two small boxes of cartridges were lying on the cuddy-table. "'Pray take this,' I said. "'It may help you to remain—' No sooner were these words out of my mouth than I perceived what grim meaning they could bear. "'May help you to get in,' I corrected myself remorsefully. He, however, was not troubled by obscure meanings. He thanked me effusively and bolted out, calling good-bye over his shoulder. I heard his voice through the ship's side urging his boatmen to give way, and looking out of the stern port I saw the boat rounding under the counter. He sat in her, leaning forward, exciting his men with voice and gestures, and as he had kept the revolver in his hand and seemed to be presenting it at their heads, I shall never forget the scared faces of the four Javanese and the frantic swing of their stroke, which snatched that vision from under my eyes. Then, turning away, the first thing I saw were the two boxes of cartridges on the cuddy-table. He had forgotten to take them. I ordered my gig manned at once, but Jim's rowers, under the impression that their lives hung on a thread while they had that madman in the boat, made such excellent time that before I had traversed half the distance between the two vessels I caught sight of him clambering over the rail, and of his box being passed up. All the brigantine's canvas was loose, her mainsail was set, and the windlass was just beginning to clink as I stepped upon her deck. Her master, a dapper little half-caste of forty or so, in a blue flannel suit, with lively eyes, his round face the colour of lemon peel, and with a thin little black moustache drooping on each side of his thick dark lips, came forward smirking. He turned out, notwithstanding his self-satisfied and cheery exterior, to be of a careworn temperament. In answer to a remark of mine, while Jim had gone below for a moment, he said, Oh, yes, Patizan. He was going to carry the gentleman to the mouth of the river, but would never ascend. His flowing English seemed to be derived from a dictionary compiled by a lunatic. Had Mr. Stein desired him to ascend, he would have reverentially, I think he meant to say respectfully, but devil only knows, reverentially made objects for the safety of properties. If disregarded, he would have presented resignation to quit. Twelve months ago he had made his last voyage there, and though Mr. Cornelius propitiated many offertories to Mr. Raja Alang and the principal populations, on conditions which made the trade a snare and ashes in the mouth, yet his ship had been fired upon from the woods by irresponsive parties all the way down the river, which causing his crew from exposure to limb to remain silent in hidings, the brigantine was nearly stranded on a sandbank at the bar, where she would have been perishable beyond the act of man. The angry disgust at the recollection, the pride of his fluency to which he turned an attentive ear, struggled for the possession of his broad, simple face. He scowled and beamed at me, and watched with satisfaction the undeniable effect of his phraseology. 
dark frowns ran swiftly over the placid sea, and the brigantine, with her fore topsail to her mast, and her main boom amidships, seemed bewildered among the cat's paws. He told me further, gnashing his teeth, that the Rajah was a laughable hyena. I can't imagine how he got hold of hyenas. While somebody else was many times falser than the weapons of a crocodile. Keeping one eye on the movements of his crew forward, he let loose his volubility, comparing the place to a cage of beasts made ravenous by long impenitence. I fancy he meant impunity. He had no intention, he cried, to exhibit himself to be made attached purposefully to robbery. The long-drawn wails, giving the time for the pull of the men catting the anchor, came to an end, and he lowered his voice. "'Plenty too much enough of Patizan,' he concluded with energy. I heard afterwards he had been so indiscreet as to get himself tied up by the neck with a rattan halter to a post planted in the middle of a mud-hole before the Rajah's house. He spent the best part of a day and a whole night in that unwholesome situation, but there is every reason to believe the thing had been meant as a sort of joke. He brooded for a while over that horrid memory, I suppose, and then addressed in a quarrelsome tone the man coming aft to the helm. When he turned to me again, it was to speak judicially, without passion. He would take the gentleman to the mouth of the river at Batu Kring, Patizan town being situated internally, he remarked, thirty miles. But in his eyes, he continued, the tone of bored, weary conviction replacing the previous voluble delivery, the gentleman was already in the similitude of a corpse. "'What? What do you say?' I asked. He assumed a startlingly ferocious demeanour, and imitated to perfection the act of stabbing from behind. "'Already like the body of one deported,' he explained, with the insufferably conceited air of his kind after what they imagine a display of cleverness. Behind him I perceived Jim smiling silently at me, and with a raised hand checking the exclamation on my lips. Then, while the half-caste, bursting with importance, shouted his orders, while the yard swung creaking and the heavy boom came surging over, Jim and I, alone, as it were, to leeward of the mainsail, clasped each other's hands and exchanged the last hurried words. My heart was freed from that dull resentment which had existed side by side with interest in his fate, the absurd chatter of the half-caste had given more reality to the miserable dangers of his path than Stein's careful statements. On that occasion the sort of formality that had always been present in our intercourse vanished from our speech. I believe I called him dear boy, and he tacked on the words old man to some half-uttered expression of gratitude, as though his risk set off against my years had made us more equal in age and in feeling." There was a moment of real and profound intimacy, unexpected and short-lived like the glimpse of some everlasting, some saving truth. He exerted himself to soothe me as though he had been the more mature of the two. "'All right, all right,' he said rapidly and with feeling. "'I promise to take care of myself. Yes, I won't take any risks. Not a single blessed risk, of course not. I mean to hang out. Don't you worry. Jove!' I feel as if nothing could touch me. Why, this is luck from the word go. I wouldn't spoil such a magnificent chance. A magnificent chance? Well, it was magnificent. But chances are what men make them, and how was I to know? As he had said, even I, even I remembered his, uh, his misfortune against him. It was true. And the best thing for him was to go. My gig had dropped in the wake of the brigantine, and I saw him aft, detached upon the light of the westering sun, raising his cap high above his head. I heard an indistinct shout, "'You shall hear of me!' Of me or from me, I don't know which. I think it must have been of me. My eyes were too dazzled by the glitter of the sea below his feet to see him clearly. I am fated never to see him clearly. But I can assure you that no man could have appeared less in the similitude of a corpse, as that half-caste croaker had put it. I could see the little wretch's face, the shape and colour of a ripe pumpkin, 
poked out from somewhere under Jim's elbow. He, too, raised his arm as if for a downward thrust. Absit Omen Chapter 24 The coast of Patizan, I saw it nearly two years afterwards, is straight and sombre and faces a misty ocean. Red trails are seen like cataracts of rust streaming under the dark green foliage of the bushes and creepers clothing the low cliffs. Swampy plains open out at the mouth of rivers, with a view of jagged blue peaks beyond the vast forests. In the offing a chain of islands, dark, crumbling shapes, stand out in the everlasting sunlit haze like the remnants of a wall breached by the sea. There is a village of fisher-folk at the mouth of the Batu Kring branch of the estuary. The river, which had been closed so long, was open then, and Stein's little schooner, in which I had my passage, worked her way up the three tides without being exposed to a fusillade from irresponsive parties. Such a state of affairs belonged already to ancient history, if I could believe the elderly headman of the fishing village, who came on board to act as a sort of pilot. He talked to me, the second white man he had ever seen, with confidence, and most of his talk was about the first white man he had ever seen. He called him Tuan Jim, and the tone of his references was made remarkable by a strange mixture of familiarity and awe. They in the village were under that lord's special protection, which showed that Jim bore no grudge. If he had warned me that I would hear of him, it was perfectly true. I was hearing of him. There was already a story that the tide had turned two hours before its time to help him on his journey up the river. The talkative old man himself had steered the canoe, and marvelled at the phenomenon. Moreover, all the glory was in his family. His son and his son-in-law had paddled, but they were only youths without experience who did not notice the speed of the canoe until he pointed out to them the amazing fact. Jim's coming to that fishing village was a blessing, but to them, as to many of us, the blessing came heralded by terrors. So many generations had been released since the last white man had visited the river, that the very tradition had been lost. The appearance of the being that descended upon them, and demanded inflexibly to be taken up to Patizan, was discomposing. His insistence was alarming, his generosity more than suspicious. It was an unheard-of request. There was no precedent. What would the Rajah say to this? What would he do to them? The best part of the night was spent in consultation, but the immediate risk from the anger of that strange man seemed so great that at last a cranky dugout was got ready. The women shrieked with grief as it put off. A fearless old hag cursed the stranger. He sat in it, as I have told you, on his tin box, nursing the unloaded revolver on his lap. He sat with precaution, than which there is nothing more fatiguing, and thus entered the land he was destined to fill with fame of his virtues, from the blue peaks inland to the white ribbon of surf on the coast. At the first bend he lost sight of the sea, with its laboring waves forever rising, sinking, and vanishing to rise again, the very image of struggling mankind and faced the immovable forest rooted deep in the soil, soaring towards the sunshine, everlasting in the shadowy might of their traditions, like life itself. And his opportunity sat veiled by his side, like an eastern bride waiting to be uncovered by the hand of the master. He, too, was the heir of a shadowy and mighty tradition. He told me, however, that he had never in his life felt so depressed and tired as in that canoe. All the movement he dared to allow himself was to reach, as it were by stealth, after the shell of half a coconut floating between his shoes, and bale some water out with a carefully restrained action. He discovered how hard the lid of a block-tin case was to sit upon. He had heroic health, but several times during that journey he experienced fits of giddiness, and between whiles he speculated hazily as to the size of the blister the sun was raising on his back, for amusement he tried, by looking ahead, to decide whether the muddy object he saw lying on the water's edge was a log of wood or an alligator. Only very soon he had to give that up. No fun in it. Always alligator. One of them flopped into the river and all but capsized the canoe, but this excitement was over directly. 
Then in a long empty reach he was very grateful to a troop of monkeys who came right down on the bank and made an insulting hullabaloo on his passage. Such was the way in which he was approaching greatness as genuine as any man ever achieved. Principally he longed for sunset, and meantime his three paddlers were preparing to put into execution their plan of delivering him up to the Rajah. I suppose I must have been stupid from fatigue, or perhaps I did doze off for a time, he said. The first thing he knew was his canoe coming to the bank. He became instantaneously aware of the forest having been left behind, of the first houses being visible higher up, of a stockade on his left, and of his boatmen leaping out together upon a low point of land, and taking to their heels. Instinctively he leaped out after them. At first he thought himself deserted, for some inconceivable reason, but he heard excited shouts, a gate swung open, and a lot of people poured out, making towards him. At the same time a boat full of armed men appeared on the river, and came alongside his empty canoe, thus shutting off his retreat. "'I was too startled to be quite cool, don't you know? And if that revolver had been loaded I would have shot somebody, perhaps two, three bodies, and, well, that would have been the end of me. But it wasn't.' "'Why not?' I asked. Well, I couldn't fight the whole population, and I wasn't coming to them as if I were afraid of my life, he said, with just a faint hint of his stubborn sulkiness in the glance he gave me. I refrained from pointing out to him that they could not have known the chambers were actually empty. He had to satisfy himself in his own way. Anyhow, it wasn't, he repeated good-humouredly, and so I just stood still and asked them what was the matter. That seemed to strike them dumb. I saw some of these thieves going off with my box. That long-legged old scoundrel Kasim, I'll show him to you tomorrow, ran out fussing to me about the Rajah wanting to see me. I said, all right. I, too, wanted to see the Rajah, and I simply walked in through the gate, and—and and <laughs> here I am. He laughed, and then, with unexpected emphasis, And do you know what's the best in it? he asked. I'll tell you. It's the knowledge that, had I been wiped out, it is this place that would have been the loser. He spoke thus to me before his house on that evening I've mentioned, after we had watched the moon float away above the chasm between the hills like an ascending spirit out of a grave. Its sheen descended cold and pale, like the ghost of dead sunlight. There is something haunting in the light of the moon. It has all the dispassionateness of a disembodied soul— and something of its inconceivable mystery. It is to our sunshine, which, say what you like, is all we have to live by, what the echo is to the sound, misleading and confusing whether the note be mocking or sad. It robs all forms of matter, which, after all, is our domain, of their substance, and gives a sinister reality to shadows alone. And the shadows were very real around us, but Jim by my side looked very stalwart, as though nothing, not even the occult power of moonlight, could rob him of his reality in my eyes. Perhaps, indeed, nothing could touch him, since he had survived the assault of the dark powers. All was silent, all was still. Even on the river the moonbeams slept as on a pool. It was the moment of high water— a moment of immobility that accentuated the utter isolation of this lost corner of the earth, the houses crowding along the wide shining sweep without ripple or glitter, stepping into the water in a line of jostling vague grey silvery forms mingled with black masses of shadow, were like a spectral herd of shapeless creatures pressing forward to drink in a spectral and lifeless stream, here and there a red gleam twinkled within the bamboo walls, warm like a living spark, significant of human affections, of shelter, of repose. He confessed to me that he often watched these tiny warm gleams go out one by one, that he loved to see people go to sleep under his eyes, confident in the security of tomorrow. "'Peaceful here, eh?' he asked. He was not eloquent— but there was a deep meaning in the words that followed. Look at these houses. There's not one where I am not trusted. Jove, I told you I would hang on. Ask any man, woman, or child. He paused. 
Well, I am all right, anyhow. I observed quickly that he had found that out in the end. I had been sure of it, I added. He shook his head. Were you? He pressed my arm lightly above the elbow. Well, then, you were right. There was elation and pride. There was awe almost in that low exclamation. Jove, he cried, only think what it is to me. Again he pressed my arm. And you asked me whether I thought of leaving. Good God! I? Want to leave? Especially now, after what you've told me of Mr. Stein's— Leave? Why, that's what I was afraid of. It would have been— It would have been harder than dying. No, on my word, don't laugh. I must feel, every day, every time I open my eyes, that I am trusted, that nobody has a right— Don't you know? Leave? For where? What for? To get what? I had told him, indeed it was the main object of my visit, that it was Stein's intention to present him at once with the house and stock of trading goods on certain easy conditions which would have made the transaction perfectly regular and valid. He began to snort and plunge at first. "'Confound your delicacy!' I shouted. "'It isn't Stein at all. It's giving you what you've made for yourself.' and in any case keep your remarks for McNeil when you meet him in the other world. I hope it won't happen soon. He had to give in to my arguments, because all his conquests, the trust, the fame, the friendships, the love, all these things that made him master had made him a captive, too. He looked with an owner's eye at the peace of the evening, at the river, at the houses, at the everlasting life of the forest, at the life of the old mankind, at the secrets of the land, at the pride of his own heart. But it was they that possessed him, and made him their own to the innermost thought, to the slightest stir of blood, to his last breath. It was something to be proud of. I, too, was proud for him, if not so certain of the fabulous value of the bargain. It was wonderful. It was not so much of his fearlessness that I thought. It is strange how little account I took of it, as if it had been something too conventional to be at the root of the matter. No, I was more struck by the other gifts he had displayed. He had proved his grasp of the unfamiliar situation, his intellectual alertness in that field of thought. There was his readiness, too. Amazing. And all this had come to him in a manner like keen scent to a well-bred hound. He was not eloquent, but there was a dignity in this constitutional reticence, there was a high seriousness in his stammerings. He had still his old trick of stubborn blushing. Now and then, though, a word, a sentence, would escape him that showed how deeply, how solemnly he felt about that work which had given him the certitude of rehabilitation. That is why he seemed to love the land, and the people, with a sort of fierce egoism, with a contemptuous tenderness, End of chapters 23 and 24 Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapters 25 and 26 Chapter 25 This is where I was prisoner for three days, he murmured to me. It was on the occasion of our visit to the Rajah, while we were making our way slowly through a kind of awe-struck riot of dependence across Tunku Alang's courtyard. Filthy place, isn't it? And I couldn't get anything to eat, either, unless I made a row about it, and then it was only a small plate of rice and a fried fish not much bigger than a stickleback. Confound them! Jove! I've been hungry prowling inside this stinking enclosure with some of these vagabonds shoving their mugs right under my nose. I'd given up that famous revolver of yours at the first demand, glad to get rid of the bally thing. Look like a fool walking about with an empty shooting-iron in my hand. At that moment we came into the presence, and he became unflinchingly grave and complimentary with his late captor. Oh, magnificent! I want to laugh when I think of it. But I was impressed, too. The old disreputable Tunku Alang could not help showing his fear, 
He was no hero, for all the tales of his hot youth he was fond of telling, and at the same time there was a wistful confidence in his manner towards his late prisoner. Note, even where he would be most hated, he was still trusted. Jim, as far as I could follow the conversation, was improving the occasion by the delivery of a lecture. Some poor villagers had been waylaid and robbed while on their way to Doryman's house, with a few pieces of gum or beeswax, which they wished to exchange for rice. "'It was Doryman who was a thief!' burst out the Rajah. A shaking fury seemed to enter that old frail body. He writhed weirdly on his mat, gesticulating with his hands and feet, tossing the tangled strips of his mop, an impotent incarnation of rage. There were staring eyes and dropping jaws all round us. Jim began to speak, resolutely, coolly, and for some time he enlarged upon the text that no man should be prevented from getting his food and his children's food honestly. The other sat like a tailor at his board, one palm on each knee, his head low, in fixing Jim through the grey hair that fell over his very eyes. When Jim had done, there was a great stillness. Nobody seemed to breathe, even. No one made a sound till the old Rajah sighed faintly, and looking up, with a toss of his head, said quickly, "'You hear, my people. No more of these little games.' This decree was received in profound silence. A rather heavy man, evidently in a position of confidence, with intelligent eyes, a bony, broad, very dark face, and a cheerily officious manner, I learned later on he was the executioner, presented to us two cups of coffee on a brass tray, which he took from the hands of an inferior attendant. "'You needn't drink,' muttered Jim very rapidly. I didn't perceive the meaning at first, and only looked at him. He took a good sip, and sat composedly holding the saucer in his left hand. In a moment I felt excessively annoyed. "'Why the devil,' I whispered, smiling at him amiably, "'do you expose me to such a stupid risk?' I drank, of course. There was nothing for it, while he gave no sign, and almost immediately afterward we took our leave. While we were going down to the courtyard to our boat, escorted by the intelligent and cheery executioner, Jim said he was very sorry. It was the barest chance, of course. Personally, he thought nothing of poison, the remotest chance. He was, he assured me, considered to be infinitely more useful than dangerous, and so— But the Raja is afraid of you abominably. Anybody can see that, I argued, with, I own, a certain peevishness, and all the time watching anxiously for the first twist of some sort of ghastly colic. I was awfully disgusted. "'If I am to do any good here and preserve my position,' he said, taking his seat by my side in the boat, "'I must stand the risk. I take it once every month, at least. Many people trust me to do that, for them. Afraid of me? That's just it. Most likely he is afraid of me, because I am not afraid of his coffee.' Then, showing me a place on the north front of the stockade, where the pointed tops of several stakes were broken, this is where I leapt over on my third day in Patizan. They haven't put up new stakes yet there. Good leap, eh? A moment later we passed the mouth of a muddy creek. This is my second leap. I had a bit of a run and took this one flying, but fell short. Thought I would leave my skin there. Lost my shoes struggling and all the time I was thinking to myself how beastly it would be to get a jab with a bally long spear while sticking in the mud like this. I remember how sick I felt wriggling in that slime. I mean really sick, as if I'd bitten something rotten. That's how it was. And the opportunity ran by his side, leaped over the gap, floundered in the mud, still veiled. The unexpectedness of his coming was the only thing, you understand, that saved him from being at once dispatched with chrises and flung into the river. They had him, but it was like getting hold of an apparition, a, a wraith, a portent. What did it mean? What to do with it? Was it too late to conciliate him? Hadn't he better be killed without more delay? But what would happen then?' 
wretched old Alang went nearly mad with apprehension, and through the difficulty of making up his mind. Several times the council was broken up, and the advisers made a break, helter-skelter for the door, and out on to the veranda. One, it is said, even jumped down to the ground, fifteen feet, I should judge, and broke his leg. The royal governor of Patizan had bizarre mannerisms, and one of them was to introduce boastful rhapsodies into every arduous discussion, when, getting gradually excited, he would end by flying off his perch with a criss in his hand. But, barring such interruptions, the deliberations upon Jim's fate went on night and day. Meanwhile he wandered about the courtyard, shunned by some, glared at by others, but watched by all and practically at the mercy of the first casual ragamuffin with a chopper in there. He took possession of a small tumble-down shed to sleep in. The effluvia of filth and rotten matter incommoded him greatly. It seems he had not lost his appetite, though, because, he told me, he had been hungry all the blessed time. Now and again some fussy ass, deputed from the council-room, would come out running to him, and in honeyed tones would administer amazing interrogatories. Were the Dutch coming to take the country? Would the white man like to go back down the river? What was the object of coming to such a miserable country? The Rajah wanted to know whether the white man could repair a watch. They actually did bring out to him a nickel clock of New England make, and out of sheer unbearable boredom he busied himself in trying to get the alarm to work, it was apparently when thus occupied in his shed that the true perception of his extreme peril dawned upon him. He dropped the thing, he says, like a hot potato, and walked out hastily without the slightest idea of what he would or indeed could do. He only knew that the position was intolerable. He strolled aimlessly beyond a sort of ramshackle little granary on posts, and his eyes fell upon the broken stakes of the palisade. And then, he says, at once, without any mental process, as it were, without any stir of emotion, he set about his escape, as if executing a plan matured for a month. He walked off carelessly to give himself a good run, and when he faced about there was some dignitary, with two spearmen in attendance, close at his elbow and ready with a question. He started off, from under their very nose, went over like a bird, and landed on the other side with a fall that jarred all his bones and seemed to split his head. He picked himself up instantly. He never thought of anything at the time. All he could remember, he said, was a great yell. The first houses of Patizan were before him, four hundred yards away. He saw the creek, and, as it were, mechanically put on more pace. The earth seemed fairly to fly backwards under his feet. He took off from the last dry spot, felt himself flying through the air, felt himself without any shock planted upright in an extremely soft and sticky mud-bank. It was only when he tried to move his legs, and found he couldn't, that in his own words he came to himself. He began to think of the Bali long spears. As a matter of fact, considering that the people inside the stockade had to run to the gate, then get down to the landing-place, get into boats, and pull round a point of land, he had more advance than he imagined. Besides it being low water, the creek was without water. You couldn't call it dry. And practically he was safe for a time from anything but a very long shot, perhaps. The high, firm ground was about six feet in front of him. "'I thought I would have to die there all the same,' he said. He reached and grabbed desperately with his hands, and only succeeded in gathering a horrible, cold, shiny heap of slime against his breast, up to his very chin. It seemed to him that he was burying himself alive. And then he struck out madly, scattering the mud with his fists. It fell on his head, on his face, over his eyes, into his mouth. He told me that he remembered suddenly the courtyard, as you remember a place where you had been very happy years ago. He longed, so he said, to be back there again, mending the clock. Mending the clock. That was the idea. He made efforts, tremendous, sobbing, gasping efforts. 
efforts that seemed to burst his eyeballs in their sockets and make him blind, and culminating into one mighty supreme effort in the darkness to crack the earth asunder, to throw it off his limbs. And he felt himself creeping feebly up the bank. He lay full length on the firm ground, and saw the light, the sky. Then, as a sort of happy thought, the notion came to him that he would go to sleep. He will have it that he did actually go to sleep, that he slept, perhaps for a minute, perhaps for twenty seconds, or only for one second. But he recollects distinctly the violent, convulsive start of awakening. He remained lying still for a while, and then he arose, muddy from head to foot, and stood there, thinking he was alone of his kind for hundreds of miles, alone with no help, no sympathy, no pity to expect from any one, like a hunted animal. The first houses were not more than twenty yards from him, and it was the desperate screaming of a frightened woman trying to carry off a child that started him again. He pelted straight on in his socks, be plastered with filth out of all semblance to a human being. He traversed more than half the length of the settlement. The nimbler women fled right and left, the slower men just dropped whatever they had in their hands, and remained petrified with dropping jaws. He was a flying terror. He says he noticed the little children trying to run for life, falling on their little stomachs and kicking. He swerved between two houses up a slope, clambered in desperation over a barricade of felled trees, there wasn't a week without some fight in Patazan at that time, burst through a fence into a maze-patch, where a scared boy flung a stick at him, blundered upon a path, and ran all at once into the arms of several startled men. He had just breath enough to gasp out, Doramin! Doramin! He remembers being half carried, half rushed to the top of the slope, and in a vast enclosure with palms and fruit-trees, being run up to a large man sitting massively in a chair in the midst of the greatest possible commotion and excitement. He fumbled in mud and clothes to produce the ring, and, finding himself suddenly on his back, wondered who had knocked him down. They had simply let him go, don't you know? But he couldn't stand. At the foot of the slope random shots were fired, and above the roofs of the settlement there rose a dull roar of amazement. But he was safe. Doramin's people were barricading the gate, and pouring water down his throat. Doramin's old wife, full of business and commiseration, was issuing shrill orders to her girls. "'The old woman,' he said softly, "'made a to-do over me as if I'd been her own son.' They put me into an immense bed, her state bed, and she ran in and out, wiping her eyes to give me pats on the back. I must have been a pitiful object. I just lay there like a log, for I don't know how long. He seemed to have a great liking for Dorimin's old wife. She, on her side, had taken a motherly fancy to him. She had a round, nut-brown, soft face, all fine wrinkles, large bright red lips, she chewed beetle assiduously, and screwed up winking benevolent eyes. She was constantly in movement, scolding busily and ordering unceasingly a troop of young women with clear brown faces and big grave eyes, her daughters, her servants, her slave girls. You know how it is in these households, it's generally impossible to tell the difference. She was very spare, and even her ample outer garment, fastened in front with jewelled clasps, had somehow a skimpy effect. Her dark bare feet were thrust into yellow straw slippers of Chinese make. I have seen her myself flitting about with her extremely thick, long grey hair falling about her shoulders. She uttered homely, shrewd sayings, was of noble birth, and was eccentric and arbitrary. In the afternoon she would sit in a very roomy armchair, opposite her husband, and gazing steadily through a wide opening in the wall, which gave an extensive view of the settlement and the river. She invariably tucked up her feet under her, but old Doramin sat squarely, sat imposingly as a mountain sits on a plain. He was only of the Nakoda, or merchant class, but the respect shown to him and the dignity of his bearing were very striking. He was the chief of the second power in Patazan. 
The immigrants from Celebes, about sixty families that, with dependents and so on, could muster some two hundred men wearing the chris, had elected him years ago for their head. The men of that race are intelligent, enterprising, revengeful, but with a more frank courage than the other Malays, and restless under oppression. They formed the party opposed to the Rajah. Of course the quarrels were for trade. This was the primary cause of faction fights, of the sudden outbreaks that would fill this or that part of the settlement with smoke, flame, the noise of shots and shrieks. Villages were burnt, men were dragged into the Rajah's stockade to be killed or tortured for the crime of trading with anybody else but himself. Only a day or two before Jim's arrival, several heads of households in the very fishing village that was afterwards taken under his especial protection, had been driven over the cliffs by a party of the Rajah's spearmen, on suspicion of having been collecting edible birds' nests for a Celebes trader. Rajah Alang pretended to be the only trader in his country, and the penalty for the breach of the monopoly was death, but his idea of trading was indistinguishable from the commonest forms of robbery. His cruelty and rapacity had no other bounds than his cowardice, and he was afraid of the organized power of the Celebes men. Only till Jim came he was not afraid enough to keep quiet. He struck at them through his subjects, and thought himself pathetically in the right. The situation was complicated by a wandering stranger, an Arab half-breed, who, I believe, on purely religious grounds, had incited the tribes in the interior, the bush-folk, as Jim himself called them, to rise, and had established himself in a fortified camp on the summit of one of the twin hills. He hung over the town of Patizan like a hawk over a poultry-yard, but he devastated the open country. Whole villages, deserted, rotted on their blackened post over the banks of clear streams, dropping piecemeal into the water the grass of their walls, the leaves of their roofs, with a curious effect of natural decay, as if they had been a form of vegetation stricken by a blight at its very root. The two parties in Patizan were not sure which one this partisan most desired to plunder. The Rajah intrigued with him feebly. Some of the Bugis settlers, weary with endless insecurity, were half inclined to call him in. The younger spirits amongst them, chafing, advised to get Sharif Ali with his wild men and drive the Rajah along out of the country. Doramin restrained them with difficulty. He was growing old, and, though his influence had not diminished, the situation was getting beyond him. This was the state of affairs when Jim, bolting from the Rajah's stockade, appeared before the chief of the Bugis, produced the ring, and was received, in a manner of speaking, into the heart of the community. Chapter 26 Doramin was one of the most remarkable men of his race I had ever seen. His bulk for a melee was immense, but he did not look merely fat. He looked imposing, monumental. This motionless body, clad in rich stuffs, colored silks, gold embroideries, this huge head enfolded in a red and gold head kerchief, the flat, big, round face, wrinkled, furrowed, with two semicircular heavy folds starting on each side of wide, fierce nostrils, and enclosing a thick-lipped mouth, the throat like a bull, the vast corrugated brow overhanging the staring, proud eyes, made a whole that once seen can never be forgotten. His impassive repose—he seldom stirred a limb when once he sat down—was like a display of dignity. He was never known to raise his voice. It was a hoarse and powerful murmur, slightly veiled as if heard from a distance. When he walked, two short, sturdy young fellows, naked to the waist, in white sarongs, and with black skull-caps on the backs of their heads, sustained his elbows. They would ease him down and stand behind his chair till he wanted to rise, when he would turn his head slowly, as if with difficulty, to the right and to the left. Then they would catch him under his armpits and help him up. For all that there was nothing of a cripple about him. On the contrary, all his ponderous movements were like manifestations of a mighty, deliberate force. 
It was generally believed he consulted with his wife as to public affairs, but nobody, as far as I know, had ever heard them exchange a single word. When they sat in state by the wide opening, it was in silence. They could see below them, in the declining light, the vast expanse of the forest country, a dark sleeping sea of sombre green undulating as far as the violet and purple range of the mountains, the shining sinuosity of the river like an immense letter S of beaten silver, the brown ribbon of houses following the sweep of both banks, overtopped by the twin hills uprising above the nearer treetops. They were wonderfully contrasted. She, light, delicate, spare, quick, a little witch-like, with a touch of motherly fussiness in her repose. He, facing her, immense and heavy, like a figure of a man roughly fashioned of stone, with something magnanimous and ruthless in his immobility. The son of these old people was a most distinguished youth. They had him late in life. Perhaps he was not really so young as he looked. Four or five and twenty is not so young when a man is already father of a family at eighteen. When he entered the large room, lined and carpeted with fine mats, and with a high ceiling of white sheeting, where the couple sat in state surrounded by a most deferential retinue, he would make his way straight to Doramin to kiss his hand, which the other abandoned to him majestically, and then would step across to stand by his mother's chair. I suppose I may say they idolized him, but I never caught them giving him an overt glance. Those, it is true, were public functions. The room was generally thronged. The solemn formality of greetings and leave-takings, the profound respect expressed in gestures on the faces, in the low whispers, is simply indescribable. "'It's well worth seeing,' Jim had assured me, while we were crossing the river on our way back. "'They are like people in a book, aren't they?' he said triumphantly. "'And Dane Warris, their son, is the best friend, barring you, I've ever had. What Mr. Stein would call a good war comrade. I was in luck. Jove, I was in luck when I tumbled amongst them at my last gasp.' He meditated with bowed head, then, rousing himself, he added, of course I didn't go to sleep over it, but— He paused again. It seemed to come to me, he murmured. All at once I saw what I had to do. There was no doubt that it had come to him, and it had come to him through war, too, as is natural since this power that came to him was the power to make peace. It is in this sense alone that might so often is right. You must not think he had seen his way at once— when he arrived, the Bugis community was in a most critical position. They were all afraid, he said to me, each man afraid for himself, while I could see as plain as possible that they must do something at once, if they did not want to go under one after another, what between the Rajah and that vagabond Sharif. But to see that was nothing. When he got his idea, he had to drive it into reluctant minds, through the bulwarks of fear, of selfishness. He drove it in at last. And that was nothing. He had to devise the means. He devised them, an audacious plan, and his task was only half done. He had to inspire with his own confidence a lot of people who had hidden and absurd reasons to hang back. He had to conciliate imbecile jealousies and argue away all sorts of senseless mistrusts. Without the weight of Doramin's authority, and his son's fiery enthusiasm, he would have failed. Dane Waris, the distinguished youth, was the first to believe in him. Theirs was one of those strange, profound, rare friendships between brown and white, in which the very difference of race seems to draw two human beings closer by some mystic element of sympathy. Of Dane Waris, his own people said with pride that he knew how to fight like a white man. This was true. He had that sort of courage. The courage in the open, I may say. But he had also a European mind. You meet them sometimes like that, and are surprised to discover unexpectedly a familiar turn of thought, an unobscured vision, a tenacity of purpose, a touch of altruism. Of small stature, but admirably well-proportioned, Dane Maurice had a proud carriage, 
a polished, easy bearing, a temperament like a clear flame. His dusky face, with big black eyes, was in action expressive, and in repose thoughtful. He was of a silent disposition. A firm glance, an ironic smile, a courteous deliberation of manner seemed to hint at great reserves of intelligence and power. Such beings, open to the western eye, so often concerned with mere surfaces, the hidden possibilities of races and lands over which hangs the mystery of unrecorded ages. He not only trusted Jim, he understood him, I firmly believe. I speak of him because he had captivated me. His, if I may say so, his caustic placidity, and at the same time his intelligent sympathy with Jim's aspirations, appealed to me. I seemed to behold the very origin of friendship. If Jim took the lead, the other had captivated his leader. In fact, Jim, the leader, was a captive in every sense. The land, the people, the friendship, the love, were like the jealous guardians of his body. Every day added a link to the fetters of that strange freedom. I felt convinced of it, as from day to day I learned more of the story. The story! Hadn't I heard the story? I've heard it on the march, in camp. He made me scour the country after invisible game. I've listened to a good part of it on one of the twin summits after climbing the last hundred feet or so on my hands and knees. Our escort, we had volunteer followers from village to village, had camped meantime on a bit of level ground halfway up the slope, and in the still breathless evening the smell of wood smoke reached our nostrils from below with the penetrating delicacy of some choice scent. Voices also ascended, wonderful in their distinct and immaterial clearness. Jim sat on the trunk of a felled tree, and, pulling out his pipe, began to smoke. A new growth of grass and bushes was springing up. There were traces of an earthwork under a mass of thorny twigs. "'It all started from here,' he said, after a long and meditative silence. On the other hill, two hundred yards across a sombre precipice, I saw a line of high blackened stakes, showing here and there ruinously the remnants of Sherif Ali's impregnable camp. But it had been taken, though. That had been his idea. He had mounted Doramine's old ordnance on the top of that hill, two rusty iron seven-pounders, a lot of small brass cannon, currency cannon. But if the brass guns represent wealth, they can also, when crammed recklessly to the muzzle, send a solid shot to some little distance. The thing was to get them up there. He showed me where he had fastened the cables, explained how he had improvised a rude capstan out of a hollowed log turning upon a pointed stake, indicated with the bowl of his pipe the outline of the earthwork. The last hundred feet of the ascent had been the most difficult. He had made himself responsible for success on his own head. He had induced the war party to work hard all night. Big fires lighted at intervals blazed all down the slope. But up here, he explained, the hoisting gang had to fly around in the dark. From the top he saw men moving on the hillside like ants at work. He himself, on that night, had kept rushing down and climbing up like a squirrel, directing, encouraging, watching all along the line. Old Doramine had himself carried up the hill in his armchair. They put him down on the level place upon the slope, and he sat there in the light of one of the big fires. "'Amazing old chap, real old chieftain,' said Jim, with his little fierce eyes, a pair of immense flintlock pistols on his knees. Magnificent things, ebony, silver-mounted, with beautiful locks, and caliber like an old blunderbuss.' A present from Stein, it seems, in exchange for that ring, you know. Used to belong to good old MacNeil. God only knows how he came by them. There he sat, moving neither hand nor foot, a flame of dry brushwood behind him, and lots of people rushing about, shouting and pulling round him. The most solemn, imposing old chap you can imagine. He wouldn't have had much chance if Sharif Ali had let his infernal crew loose at us and stampeded up my lot, eh? Anyhow, he had come up there to die if anything went wrong. No mistake. Jove, it thrilled me to see him there, like a rock. 
but the sheriff must have thought us mad, and never troubled to come up to see how we got on. Nobody believed it could be done. Why, I think the very chaps who pulled and shoved and sweated over it did not believe it could be done. Upon my word, I don't think they did. He stood erect, the smouldering briarwood in his clutch, with a smile on his lips and a sparkle in his boyish eyes. I sat on the stump of a tree at his feet, and below us stretched the land, the great expanse of the forest, sombre under the sunshine, rolling like a sea, with glints of winding rivers, the grey spots of villages, and here and there a clearing, like an islet of light amongst the dark waves of continuous treetops. A brooding gloom lay over this vast and monotonous landscape. The light fell on it as if into an abyss. The land devoured the sunshine. Only far off, along the coast, the empty ocean, smooth and polished within the faint haze, seemed to rise up to the sky in a wall of steel. And there I was with him, high in the sunshine on the top of that historic hill of his. He dominated the forest, the secular gloom, the old mankind. He was like a figure set up on a pedestal to represent in his persistent youth the power and perhaps the virtues of races that never grow old, that have emerged from the gloom. I don't know why he should always have appeared to me symbolic. Perhaps this is the real cause of my interest in his fate. I don't know whether it was exactly fair to him to remember the incident which had given a new direction to his life, but at that moment I remembered very distinctly. It was like a shadow in the light. End of chapters 25 and 26